Good evening. My name is Sam Wiseman, and I'm a student project manager at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues at Dickinson College. On behalf of the Clark Forum, the Churchill Fund, the Center for Sustainability Education, and the Departments of Earth Sciences, Biology, International Business and Management, International Studies, and Policy Studies, I would like to welcome you to tonight's event, Melting Ice, Rising Seas, Shifting Shorelines, The New Reality. When asked about sea level rise, the quick response for many is, not in my lifetime. This relaxed attitude persists in conversations about this serious issue. And yet, historic melting trends have set the world on a path toward inevitable change. The question is no longer if, but when the impacts will be felt worldwide. Coastal real estate and low-lying nations will be the first to feel the pressures of this new age, but change will occur around the world, and its impacts will be diverse. My family's boat trips to tiny Cedar Island on the eastern shore of Virginia have changed over the years. Every time we canoed down the winding creek, the coast on the barrier island had inched further and further inland. Tides and annual storm surges pushed up against my grandmother's yard. And, like many, I watched in awe as floodwaters cascaded through the streets of New York and New Jersey, bringing the dramatic realities of sea level rise closer to home. The sea level crisis emerged in my studies in a variety of contexts, as new national security frontiers and in the adaptations of cities around the world. John Englander's unique approach uh, to understanding the impacts of sea rising seas resonated with me in its comprehensive scope, incorporating the perspectives of security, oceanography, and the economy, among other diverse directions. John Englander defies definition in a single field. In his time at Dickinson College, he began an interdisciplinary career by somehow managing a geology and economics double major, a complex focus that has continued to expand. He is a scuba diver and polar explorer, as well as a leader in the private sector and CEO of major influential organizations, including the International Sea Keepers Society, the International uh, Sea Level Institution, and the Cousteau Society. As a sea level expert, Englander predicted the impact of Hurricane Sandy in his acclaimed book, High Tide on Main Street. While as the founder of the Rising Seas Group, he continues to urge intelligent adaptation to government agencies and businesses alike. He is a sought-after keynote speaker and has been interviewed for major news networks worldwide. Englander's range of diverse experiences allows him to research and explore the realities of a changing world, work across sectors to adapt to these changes, and spread public awareness, while constantly seeking the long-term, bigger picture. At this time, I ask that you please silence all cell phones and electronic devices. A question and answer session will follow the lecture, so please hold all questions until then. A book sale and signing will also follow tonight's event. And now, please join me in welcoming John Englander. Thank you. Is this on? Is this on? Yes? OK. It, you know, I, I like to say every place I go to talk, it's a pleasure to be here. It's, it's a particular pleasure to come back to Dickinson. Um, I think the last time I was here, the best I can figure out was 1987, my 15th reunion. I graduated the class of 72, and uh, at least one of my classmates is here. It's, uh, the campus looks a little different, but also very much the same, too. And, and it really is a, a, a privilege, and I'm glad the Clark Forum has uh, sponsored this evening and, it, and brought this interdisciplinary approach. It's really appropriate, as I think you're going to see. I'm going to tell you at the end how to get some of the slides with a email, simple email that I'll, I'll give you at the end. But if any of you do tweets, it's at John Englander, and, and we certainly encourage that. The, usually people find a couple of uh, memorable factoids or, uh, or lines when I give these presentations. And every presentation is different, literally, uh, whether I'm talking to a national security interest or a town in Maryland, Annapolis, I was there last week, or California, or Hong Kong, or Copenhagen. Sea level impacts different places differently. And while it's a global phenomenon that maybe we don't see big enough, and I try and help do that, the impacts are more local. And so it's kind of a, a yin and yang thing, and you have to look at it both ways. So melting ice, rising seas, this happens to be Annapolis. This was during uh, Isabel, a storm. And uh, shifting shorelines, this was the last house on Holland Island in the Chesapeake. There's different ways to look at sea level rise. And I'm going to take you through some of that tonight, and we're certainly going to have time for questions, because I want to I want you to leave the room with every question answered that relates directly to sea level rise. 
something's happening that's new. That street in Fort Lauderdale, uh, the Ocean Avenue in front of the hotels, it, this flooded during, not Sandy, it was a month later during a no-name storm. It had never happened before like that. In fact, four blocks of the road were wiped out. Um, something's happening slowly, and it's hard to see because of the confluence and interaction between storms, tides, and sea level rise, which have entirely different magnitudes and characteristics. And I want you to start thinking about that, because they add up, or they can add up, for combined or even greater effect, but they really need to be understood individually. This is the dock at Annapolis, and you've noticed that there's water on both sides of the bulkhead there, from where the boats are and where the cars were supposed to be. But this issue goes beyond that. Naval Station Norfolk has spent tens of millions of dollars already coping with sea level rise. It's exacerbated there because in the Hampton Roads area, they have a greater subsidence because of a plate tectonic effect, uh, not because of uh, the, the ground compacting as in New Orleans. So different places have different amounts of subsidence, or in some cases uplift, like Los Angeles or even Alaska, where ground is coming upward. And if you're going to look at sea level rise, we have to kind of pull apart these different components, which I'm going to try and help you to do tonight. But I really want to focus this evening on this interdisciplinary aspect. We had a lunch meeting with some of the earth sciences and environmental science uh, students and professors today and drilled a little deeper on some of the scientific aspects. But this, some of them are here tonight, I think. This opportunity is really to think a little more holistically about how does this cross over into other disciplines and what does it mean for our world, geopolitically, international relations, national security, other aspects. This is a historic house in Fort Lauderdale, the Stranahan House. It's been there well over 100 years. When they put that house in, it didn't used to flood over the seawall like that. Something's happening different, but it's kind of slow and gradual. San Francisco's Embarcadero, probably a lot of you have been there at some point in your lives on the famous waterfront, seven and a half miles along the waterfront in San Francisco, Pier 19 with the sea lions and so on. The elevation of that Embarcadero has been there for 140 years. That's when they established the elevation of the Embarcadero. It was fill land, actually. They have not had subsidence of any note in San Francisco. It's actually been almost neutral in terms of uplift or subsidence. So the water that's crashing over the seawall there every 14 and 28 days with the full moon cycle or new moon didn't used to happen. What's different? But it's not just in the ocean like Florida or Annapolis on the Chesapeake or the Embarcadero. It's cities on tidal rivers. This is Sacramento, 80 miles inland. But it's protected by earthen levees. It was built up over the last century or two. There's 1,100 miles of earthen levees in San Sacramento, more than are vulnerable in New Orleans. We don't think of it. We've taken things for granted as being static, as if the ocean level is not going to change. We build things up to a static ocean height and then worry about the intermittent storm. Sea level is going to change all that, and we need to start thinking differently. There's neighborhoods, this one happens to be in Florida, where there were storm drains put in, and they were put in to really get excess rainfall that would run down the slope and divert it into the nearest waterway or some kind of a sump. Well, every 28 days, the, wa the salt water backs up through those grates now. All over the world this is happening. Happens every 14 or 28 days with a full or new moon. Certain months of the year when the planets line up, it's even worse. This is the peak of the year, it's, so the maximum effect. That's not, that's not rainwater. That's salt water that's backed up in the streets. So did that happen when this community was designed 60 years ago? No, never happened. We're seeing more attention to sea level rise cover of National Geographic three years ago, two years ago, I guess it was. Um, they show how much sea level will rise when all the ice on the planet has melted against the Statue of Liberty. Same point I make in the first sentence of my book, the, but that's centuries from now, maybe, maybe millennia. We don't know, and I'll talk about why we don't know. So you can get people's attention with that, but the truth is that's a little too far in the future. We need to start thinking about the next 30 to 50 years, maybe beyond some of our lifetimes, but certainly within our kids' lifetimes for sure. But the fact is it's within the planning horizon for new structures and infrastructure. And I'd like to suggest to you that that's the sweet spot to start thinking about mid-century, 34 years from now, 30 to 50 years. End of century is too far. Five-year plans are too short. Mid-century is about right. 
It's a building cycle, it's a mortgage cycle, it's a generation, uh, you know, somewhere in that 24 to, to 30 year time frame. And that's about when we could see something pretty nasty happen with sea level that we're not even seeing yet. So the two facts that I like to point out to people is that sea level has hardly changed in 5,000 years, which happens to be human civilization as we know it. And the last time sea level was higher was 120,000 years ago, as we'll see. I'm going to take you through a short course in, uh, in the Ice Ages, or Quaternary uh, history as we would think of it, perhaps in geology. Um, and back then it got a lot higher. And we need to start seeing that. So this is all kind of a push for Professor Marcus Key's department here, you know, getting people in the geology department. We need to expand the, the staff, I know. And, and, uh, but this goes way beyond geology, as you'll see, or earth sciences, as you call it now. Just to start with some real basics, we tend to think of this intuitively, but sea level's the baseline. You can think of it as the low tide point, then there's high tide every day, and then when there's storm surge, and if the storm hits at a high tide, it all kind of stacks up, and the higher it gets, the more it goes inland. That's, that's intuitive, we can figure that out. But the difference is that sea level was always presumed to be a static line. We did not think that in the course of a century that sea level could change. So flooding was always temporary, and you could recover, and you could be resilient. Resilient implies getting back to the status of the normal before. Sea level challenges us differently because sea level will not allow us to be resilient. We can be adaptive, but not resilient. Language matters. Those of you who are English majors, I would, I would point out that uh, the nuance of how we communicate is really critical on this. Because when we say be resilient to sea level rise, I say, what, are you going to wait a thousand years? I mean, how are you going to adapt to what it was like before? For every foot of rise, to give you a couple of facts or factoids, uh, for every vertical foot of rise, coastal um, experts estimate, according to some called the Brun Rule, that the average horizontal incursion is 300 to 1. Now that's stunning. When you look at a beach, this is, happens to be a Florida beach, it doesn't look like that. You could say that if you go up a foot, you're not going to go 300 feet inland. But here's what we're not thinking of. The flat places, whether they be the Everglades, whether it be Bangladesh, whether it be Vietnam, or up tidal rivers are where you lose the land. And in fact, right here in Florida, behind this beach berm, which goes up about 20 feet, as you can see, it drops down to the intercoastal waterway and then gets flat out toward the Everglades. When sea level is two feet higher, you're not gonna miss much beach, but those houses on the, on the canals, half mile inland, are gonna be flooded. So we're programmed to look in the wrong places. We're programmed for the wrong words. We're, we're melding sea level rise with storms and tides. There's lots of projections for sea level rise. We'll talk about why they vary so much, but you're gonna see different curves. This one is done by the Southeast Florida uh, Regional Group, the four counties that have agreed to work together and, uh, to, for projections. There, there are differences to the projections of sea level rise. I'm going to talk about why in a few minutes. Um, they should not be misunderstood to be either poor science or ignorance or anything else. There are some reasons why we can't know how fast sea level rise. It simply comes down to how warm will the planet be and if you heat Antarctica and Greenland by a certain amount, how quickly can you melt two miles of ice? We don't know the answer to that question. We've never done it in 100,000 years. We're running the experiment now. You're part of it. It's not a really good experiment, but we're doing it anyway. What do we know about sea level? We know that in the last 100 years or so, this is since 1850, 160 years, 165 years, I guess, that sea level has risen as a global average about eight inches. Or for those of you that prefer metric, that's about 18 or 20 centimeters. The, the blips up and down are an interesting scientific question. Why does it vacillate a little bit? But the truth is that's such micro measurements when you think that the whole thing is eight inches. The truth is measuring that as a global average sea level strains the accuracy of how we measure it, and we should not get absorbed by it. The fact is that the slope of the line, the trend of the line, tells us the story. I mean, in finance, they say that the, friend, the trend is your friend, or can be your friend, even if it's not going in the direction you want, if you can see the trend, 
because you can get ahead of it. You can short a stock, et cetera. Okay? In other words, if sea level is rising for 166 years like this, we would be well advised to plan that's going to continue. But that same eight inches shown here as a red wavy line near the bottom coming across that chart with 13 vertical bars tells us the next thing that's surprising. That for a global eight inch average, this is actually showing since 1880, but there's not much difference than that in 1850, frankly. That that same eight inch global average is 46 inches in Grand Isle or New Orleans on the left, 30 inches in Norfolk, 14 in New York, 12 in Miami, and four in Los Angeles. So here's the next great opportunity to teach what subsidence means. Because while sea level may be rising at fractions of an inch a year, some land goes down fractions of an inch per year, known as subsidence, and some goes uplift, gets, gets higher. And you have to add or subtract uplift or subsidence, and that's why in the same period of time that we've had eight inches of global sea level rise, that sea level in the United States has ranged from four inches to 46 inches. So you need to evaluate sea level rise and the risk and the problem and the adaptation for a particular region uh, based upon geology and subsidence. Well, let's go back to the ice ages. And this is actually, it's interesting how I stumbled onto this expertise. I, I studied ancient sea levels here in paleogeology 44 years ago, 45 years ago. And it made an impression on me because I was a diver. And I, when I'd go diving, I'd like to find ancient sea levels and shorelines 100 feet underwater or so. Gave me a good justification for doing some deeper diving, which I like to do. Um, but it really, it was, it, there was a relevance to you know, finding these ancient beaches and so on. Never thought it would change in my lifetime. Since the last ice age 20, peaked about 22,000 years ago, well, we say ice age, the truth is we're still in an ice age for those of you that know something about earth science. That was the last glacial maximum when the, when the ice sheets were at their maximum. But in commonplace, we talk about it as the ice age, as if that was 22,000 years ago. So we'll use that nomenclature, even though technically in earth science you wouldn't say that. But during, at the peak of the last ice age, 22,000 years ago, sea level was down 390 feet. And it rose up in a couple of bumps, as you can see in the middle there, and it got to the present level about 6,000 years ago. That's about the beginning of human civilization, our written records. Give or take a couple of thousand years, right? Less than 10,000 for sure. So if we have trouble believing that sea level is going to rise, maybe that's why, because in all of human civilization, it hasn't changed much. Makes sense. Now, some of you have not studied uh, ice age history, and it's important to understand how ice ages have gone up and down in a natural cycle and how we've changed them. And I know that the non-science majors hate to kind of do the science and the math and the complex stuff, so I'm going to make this as painless as possible. And if you remember the four-part science series, this was Ice Age Part Two: The Meltdown. How many of you saw this? OK, good. My daughter was six when this came out. I saw this 30 or 40 times, probably. And behind Manny, Diego, Scat, and Sid, OK, surprised they know their names? Yeah. <laughs> I can tell, anyway, um, there's two miles of ice there. Two miles of ice, about 10,000 feet. 10,000 feet of ice over the northern hemisphere turned into about 400 feet of sea level rise. That's about all you need to know to understand the correlation. We don't have to make this technical. But we can show it in lots of different ways. Florida, we know what it looks like today. It's that uh, strange or sexy shape, um, as everybody in the world knows. But 20,000 years ago, Florida was twice the size because sea level was down 390 feet, and the shallow bank on the west side of Florida became land. And conversely, 120,000 years ago, at the last warm spot in the Ice Age cycle, Florida was half the size because Florida the sea level got 25 feet higher than today. So it's a pretty easy place to see the, the effect because it's a peninsula and because it's pretty flat. There's other ways to visualize this because this is pretty disruptive. And, and you know, seeing numbers or words or, uh, may or may not make an impression. We tend to be visual. So I took a 47-story building in Miami. You can do it anywhere, for that matter. And I showed that we are effectively at the 30th floor of the building, because 390 feet down is about 30 stories. So at the beginning of the last ice age, 20,000 years ago, or the maximum, I should say, sea level was down at the ground floor. 
and sea level rose over 14 or 15,000 years up to the 30th floor. This is a visual metaphor. There's enough ice remaining so that when it all melts, which won't happen for several centuries at least, in the worst case, maybe a couple of thousand years, that sea level will rise another 17 stories, another 212 feet. It's stunning. I mean, even if you've studied this, I mean, I, I, with due respect, I suspect Marcus, you know, when you think of it this way, it's just stunning to comprehend it, even though we study pieces of it, right? I mean, that's just physical reality. That's not some bad metaphor. That is actually the numbers from the history of geologic history, right? So let's lay it out a different way. And I'm, this is going to be kind of the end of the sciencey part of this. I'm going to get through it pretty quickly because I want to talk to you about effects and interdisciplinary aspects. Um, that's 400,000 years. Kind of looks like a jagged line, but you can sort of see a little bit of a pattern. But if I lay on top of that blue line for sea level, 400,000 years left to right, and I lay on top of that two, um, sorry, this is slide out of sequence, so I'll skip around here for a second. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Let's go to the Arctic, the polar ice cap. Now, most people, when they see photos of the melting Arctic, they think that's why sea level's rising. How many of you would associate that, would think the melting Arctic is why sea level's rising? Honest? OK, most of the room. That's about normal. It's wrong. The ice cubes that are in the Arctic, those icebergs, are like ice cubes in a glass. About 10% are above the surface. Draw a line on the glass. You can do this at home with a glass of iced tea or anything. And if you don't take anything out of the glass or add anything to it, the level will not change. It's floating ice. Same with that ice around the polar ice cap around the North Pole. That's surprising to people. The reason that sea level is rising is the glaciers on land, as they migrate from land to ocean, that's like putting another ice cube in the glass or pouring some more water in from the meltwater. That's why sea level rises. The other reason is the thermal expansion of seawater, which again sounds really technical, but you know in the wintertime when it gets really cold or in the summertime when it gets really hot, parts don't fit sometimes, keys don't fit in locks and things like that, the dimensions change. That's because most substances have a very small adjustment in measurement with temperature. The oceans have been warmed one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. They are about four inches taller because of expansion. Now, they're an average 12,000 feet deep, so it's a minuscule amount, but another four inches of sea level rise. doesn't matter whether it comes from melting ice or thermal expansion. It's four inches of sea level rise. The other thing to notice on these glaciers, this is from, I think, Svalbard, which is north of Norway, but it may be Greenland, but it's probably Svalbard, um, is the black snow. And the soot and other components that come out of the atmosphere these days we can think of them as carbon pollution. But the black snow accelerates the warming. Because obviously a dark substance as opposed to a white substance, if you paint a roof black that used to be white, it's going to absorb heat more. And in fact, I should have pointed that out in that previous photo. The importance of the Arctic melting is not adding to sea level. But it's that as you go from bright white to black ocean or dark ocean, we're accelerating the warming. The other takeaway from the melting Arctic Again, it's not sea level rise, but when people say, oh, this has happened before, it's, this is a natural thing. It's happened before. Um, the Arctic's been frozen for about three million years. It's going to be ice-free sometime in the next couple of decades for some time in September and then increasing periods of time each decade thereafter because the oceans have warmed. And ice melts at 32 degrees, whether you're Republican or Democrat. It doesn't really care what you believe, right? It's important to get people to laugh a little bit. I do it very purposefully. Believe me, I talk to lots of different audiences and some political. This is tough stuff and it can be depressing. And it's important that it not be because we've got to deal with it. And so find ways to keep a sense of humor. And the truth is, I'm going to show you a little further on. I like to think of this as the glass half empty uh, or, or half full, not half empty. Look at the positive side of this. And strange as it may seem, there are some positive perspectives on sea level rise. And you know that's about as honestly as I can say it. But the fact that the Arctic has been frozen for more or less 3 million years and is going to be ice free for a few weeks and then increasing periods of time because of the warming ocean should be a powerful message. I mean, this is what's happening now is not a natural cycle. 
So the problem or potential problem from sea level rise is that we have enough ice on land to raise sea level about 212 feet. That comes from 24 feet in Greenland and 186 feet in Antarctica, give or take a couple of feet. And then all the ice that's in the glaciers of the world from Alaska to the Alps to every continent pretty much, um, that adds another two or three feet. Now, it's been pretty stable for hundreds of thousands, if not millions, actually millions of years. It's been pretty stable for several million years, for the quaternary, for two and a half million years. We've had cycles of ice ages, but in a stable pattern, right? Something's happening now that's different, and we know what it is. But let's look at, uh, this is Greenland, and Greenland's a flat ice sheet. There aren't much mountains on Greenland. The water's melting faster, or the ice is melting faster and faster. It's, co it's, it's coalescing in streams and finding cracks to go down to the base of the ice sheet. And when I was there in 2007, we, looked the, we went out on the ice sheet by helicopter, but the helicopter pilots and the scientists estimated there were about 100 of these moulons, these vertical shafts, carrying the meltwater down to the base. And it gets underneath the glaciers and speeds them up because now they're lubricated. They're not grinding along on bedrock anymore. And so they're doubling, tripling, and quadrupling in speed as they move toward the ocean, breaking off and then adding to sea level rise. But by 2012, which was a record warm year, there were about 1,000 of these moulons. So forget the accuracy of the instruments. You can just count the number of these blue holes, in effect. And a tenfold increase in five years is, again, stunning testament to something nonlinear and not incremental is happening here. Antarctica, um, bigger island, more mountains, thicker ice. If you take the greater size of the island and the greater thickness of the ice sheet, it has seven times more ice as Greenland. It's the big problem in terms of potential sea level rise. Now, when I studied this stuff uh, 45 years ago, there was no such thing as ice core technology. But back in about the, eight, uh, the 90s, one of the really innovative things that just, you know, it's just we had molecular techniques in medicine, um, the ocean core drilling from the, the deep sea sediments and the ice cores kind of revolutionized how we look at ancient geology or science. And the neat thing is that by drilling down in Greenland and Antarctica, Different teams from different countries have kind of competed on advancing the science. They come up with a pretty similar picture of the past. And in Greenland, we get over 100,000 years of data. In Antarctica, we can get back about 800,000 years of data. And between Greenland and Antarctica, the first 100,000 years pretty well matches. So we know, it, we know the science is a pretty good indicator of a global picture. And what we find is that these, uh, I don't know if this pointer, in this slice here, which is probably like a year of snow that's been compacted into ice and pressurized ice, the little bright spots are air bubbles. And we know they're intact because when you drop them in ice or scotch or something, they hiss because they're, they're depressurizing. So we know it's an intact air sample. And you can go in there and actually get the carbon dioxide percentage. And we know temperature because there's two isotopes of oxygen, 16 and 18, that just by according to molecular weight change with temperature. So we have a really good indicator of carbon dioxide. In fact, we measure carbon dioxide going back 800,000 years. And we have a really good proxy for temperature, at least on a relative scale. And then we can find ancient sea levels in physical geology or marine geology. So when we take that lower graph, which you've already seen in blue, which is sea level over 400,000 years, and we layer on top of that global average temperature, which we get from those ice cores and also deep sea sediments through other markers, and then on top of that put a carbon dioxide, a greenhouse gas in green, an amazing picture comes true. And this is assembled from lots of data sets. This isn't somebody drawing a couple of squiggly lines. This is the composite of different data sets from different countries and different sources, trying to piece together a jigsaw puzzle of what do we know about ancient sea level, temperature, and carbon dioxide. And I think, and I know it becomes clear to everybody, even skeptics, that when you look at this and you say a couple of things, first of all, there really was a natural climate cycle. It's called the Ice Ages. We didn't doubt that. We knew that for, what, at least a half a century, uh, maybe even a century, that there was an Ice Age as it, with a regular, well, the, the regular periodicity to the Ice Ages was perhaps a little bit later, middle of the last century. But um, 
It's about every 100,000 years. It turns out it's because of something called the Milankovitch cycles. I, I explain it in the book if really simply. It's not complicated. It's the variation in the Earth's orbit and tilt and, and uh, wobble. And it was identified in, I think, 1938 that that was enough to trigger an ice age by varying the amount of sunlight we get by less than a percent. It was enough to trigger an ice age. Because the Earth system, it turns out, was pretty in balance with the, our heat equation. So the problem is that we've had four ice ages in this picture. And the truth is, this picture could go back 10 times to the left. This pattern has been going on for three or four million years. I'm just showing you four so that you can see a very clear repetition, but with some detail. Okay? And carbon dioxide, you know how we record that. I just showed you that from the ice cores. So now we have, through finding ancient sea levels, shark's teeth or speleothems, I mean, stalactites, stalagmites, there's different ways to determine ancient shorelines. And if we layer these things or here, it's amazing the three line up. And people say, wow, that's a coincidence. Well, of course, it's not a coincidence. You couldn't have four, you couldn't have four independent lines or three independent lines like this in four periods and have the peaks all line up. That would be, be, be beyond chance. And the fact is, it makes sense. We know that carbon dioxide was proven to be a greenhouse gas in 1826 before electricity was even dealt with. I mean, that's how basic the physics was about carbon dioxide trapping heat. And when the oceans warm through some other means like volcanism, volcanoes, the ocean warms, they release carbon dioxide. That's because of a law of physics. So the truth is, according to some very simple physics principles, either carbon dioxide or temperature can, it, can lead, but the other one will always follow. That's physics. And then, of course, if the planet's warmer or colder, it's going to determine the size of the ice sheets. And that's going to determine sea level. Oh, it makes sense, right? So this isn't something we don't understand. The truth is we understand it very well. This picture makes perfect sense. And the problem we have is that this pattern of, a sea, of an ice age every 95 to 125,000 years, which is the variation of those three orbital factors I mentioned, the, the ellipse, the wobble, and the tilt, that that 95 to 125,000 years would have been kept going on, but we came along and somewhere, you know, our civilization again is, whether it's five or 10,000 years, some people would say we, we humanoids have been around for a couple of hundred thousand years, certainly not a million years, but we didn't affect the environment till thousands of years ago, maybe five, 10, 20,000. You know, the earliest archeologic shards are 40,000 somewhere in that, in that realm, okay. Whenever we started doing artwork and tools is fine, but we weren't changing the environment per se. That all happened relatively recently, within 10,000 years. And 10,000 years on this chart is almost hard to notice because this is 400,000 years. But the thing that's breaking us out of the cycle here that we can't ignore is carbon dioxide because it turns out that, again, going back about three or four million years, CO2 ranges from 180 to 280 parts per million, as you can see. Temperature ranges, global average, up and down five degrees Celsius or nine Fahrenheit, same thing. And sea level moves up and down 300, three to 400 feet in a regular pattern. And that graph probably would have kept going for another few million years, except for one species that decided to liberate the carbon that was stored in the ground. And, and it wasn't beavers. It was that other species that changes the environment. Um, us, by the way. Um, and the problem is that we've got over 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide now. First time we've had that high level of carbon dioxide in over 10 million years to our knowledge. Things have changed. And when people say, oh, well, long time ago, you know, it, it was higher than this. Well, yeah, but uh, we wouldn't have been alive. So we've got to get time scale right. In fact, Earth science time scale is what puts the lie to the misunderstanding about climate change. Because sure, climate changed before. We, you, we've been teaching geo, um, ice age cycles for centuries, or well, at least a century. Nobody doubts we've had climate changes, natural cycles. But something now is different. And we know, actually, this picture, and this will be in the slides. I'll tell you how to get with a simple email at the end of this. You can get this in about 10 other slides and use them because I want you to share this information for free, because we've got to get this word out there. Because even when you show this to people who don't believe this, it's really hard to refute this. 
And by the way, if some of you know the, have heard of the famous NASA scientist, Dr., former NASA scientist, Dr. James Hansen, who I think got the Priestley Award a couple of years ago here. Um, I've done some work with Hansen. He was really helpful as I was struggling through some parts of my book. And this chart is largely done on his work, but rearranged with his help and his, uh, his colleague, uh, Mikiko Sato. And I, that's, their names are shown here on the side. I want to give them full credit. Jim had done this as two parts, but never combined the charts before, and never combined the historical with the recent. And it suddenly just puts everything in context. So uh, I'm in a, near the end of the slides, and I, I do want to allow time for questions and get out of here before midnight. So um, what I, I want to start to do is talk about our attitude and an interdisciplinary approach to this. Because this is a big deal. I think you know that. that if sea level's higher and the shorelines moved inland, real estate's going to disappear. Cities are going to disappear. It's going to affect national security, foreign relations, shipping, ports. You know, we tend to talk about the, the Maldives are going to go underwater. I mean, I've been in the Maldives, and I'm, I'd be sad if they disappear as Tuvalu and Kiribati, the other islands in the Pacific and in Indian Ocean, they'll disappear first. I lived in the Bahamas half my life. Um, most of the Bahamian Islands will be gone sometime in the next few centuries. Miami will be gone sometime in the next few centuries. Now, how we think about this and how we educate, not only at a college level, but at a community level and within different professions is really important. And I think it's, uh, you know, the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues or Contemporary, is that, did I get that right? Um, you know, it's as good a forum as any to think about this as a contemporary issue. This, no, no generation has ever had to face this before. And we get really sophisticated about DNA or earth science or psychology or biology and, and uh, you know, uh, lots of different engineering and physics and particles. But this issue of sea level and the shoreline determines where we live. It's wealth, it's nations, it's cities, it's homes, it's businesses, it's investments. And the issue of sea level rise out of all the issues of climate change does get people's attention for that reason. And I invite you to share that. A lot, I've been on, on boards of conferences that were about sea level rise and they kept making them synonymous. I, and I realized that just to be different, they would switch from sea level rise to climate change. I said, wait a minute, this conference is about sea level rise. Yeah, well, it's the same as climate change. I said, no, it's not. It's one manifestation of climate change, but it's really singular, and they're not interchangeable. It's like the you know, leg of an animal. I mean, it may be an important part of it, but sea level rise can no longer be stopped. So here's where it really gets either scary or interesting. Most of the effort to deal with climate change now focus on what's called mitigation, a word that I hate, by the way, Let's just call it slowing, which is much, much more in my vocabulary. Um, slowing climate change means reducing greenhouse gases because of that chart you just saw. Even if we're 100% successful, even if tomorrow morning the world figures out how to make all energy from renewable sources, never burns another lump of coal or takes any more oil out of the ground or natural gas, sea level's still going to rise. That's a sobering reality. Think of that. We already at 400 parts per million. The highest in the last 10 million years was 280 parts per million. The oceans have already been warmed one and a half degrees Fahrenheit, almost a degree Celsius. Even the big climate talks in Paris, which you may remember two months ago, the early part of December, the COP21, which is the conference of the parties that was the 21st time that they've met to try and come up with rules about climate change. Even what they came out with was that 196 nations signed an agreement and said that by the year 2050, I think, we will try and keep global warming to no more than 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. But they agreed they didn't know how to get there. So it was kind of like saying, well, I'd like to diet and get my weight down to 170, but I have no idea how I'm going to get there. They set a goal. That's a, and I'm not denigrating it, okay? They set a goal. It's laudable. It's great they set a goal. They don't know how to get there, but even if we could get there, even if we could keep the warming to another degree Celsius, 
roughly one and a half degrees Fahrenheit. That's warming twice what we've already warmed. So whatever melting we're already seeing in Greenland and Antarctica is going to get a lot worse. That hasn't registered. People think, well, if we just do recycling and green things and save the sea turtles and everything, you know, and bike to work and, and uh, reset the thermostat and change the light bulbs and drive Priuses, everything will be fine. That's delusional. It's wrong. We've got to do two things. We have to find a way to slow the warming. If we don't, sea level and all the other impacts are going to be worse. But we've got to realize that even if we magically figured out all the environmental issues and all the energy issues and solved climate change, magically, we're still going to have sea level rise. So I conclude that when you really look at this simply, it is a way to focus people's attention and say, we should slow climate change. We should reduce greenhouse gases. I absolutely, I really do believe that. It's a high priority. And I think we should do that economically by pricing carbon. But that's not my expertise. People can argue about how to do that. And we can have great debates about the best way to do that. But I found that I can explain the science to the point that even people who come in the room as real skeptics, and I welcome the skeptics. I don't, I don't normally talk to environmental audience. I go to the conservative audiences, Fox Business Channel. I, I, I love challenging people who think that they're going to teach me the science. It hasn't happened yet. I have not been stumped. And I would say, with the exception of a few people who walk out of the room saying, I'm just not sure, I've at least got them into the neutral category, most people say, I get it. Because the numbers add up. I mean, they just, it's really hard to refute that picture of the ice ages when you distill it down to that and put it in a timeline. So I found that the reason, I don't talk about climate change until about chapter six or seven in this book, that it's about sea level, because sea level is about the shoreline, and the shoreline is about real estate. And that gets people's attention. And while we should do all of the other environmental green things, and I wasn't being flip. I may have sounded it. I, I recycle every day. I do all of those things I describe. We have a hybrid car and so on. I am not making fun of that. I'm saying you can't do those things thinking you're going to solve sea level rise. Okay? We've got to do two things at once. Walk and chew gum, okay, in this case. We have to work to reduce the warming. That's carbon. We have to begin planning for higher sea level. We have to do a lot of other environmental issues that are neither of those two things. Some of them are animal issues. Some of them are just are recycling, conserving materials, being more sustainable on this planet. We should do four things. We should reduce the carbon so we slow the warming, so sea level doesn't get worse quicker. We should start preparing for higher sea level. We should do all the, deal with the, all the other facts of climate change, changing weather patterns, warmer temperatures, droughts, floods, whatever. And then we should do all those other environmental things that we call the green things. But we shouldn't mix those four things as if they're one and the same. That's overly simplistic and just frankly wrong. So the glass half full versus the glass half empty is this. Um, you know, there, there is risk. The danger that's inherent in sea level rise, though, is, is a little special. It's not going to kill many people. I mean, indirectly, maybe a few. But not like 200,000 people overnight like the tsunami that hit Indonesia. Not the nuclear disaster that came out of the Fukushima tsunami, which caused other problems. Not um, like a tornado or other events that happened in the middle of the night, you know, or in minutes, earthquakes. Collapse building. Sea level is going to rise at the worst couple of inches a year. You can move a wheelchair out of the way of that. I mean, it doesn't, you know, that's not a problem. But we've got to adapt to it. And it means our economies, our societies, our national security, our foreign relations, our agriculture, our water supply, because you get saltwater intrusion, our hazardous waste sites that are going to get wet that were never thought to be, become saturated. We have a lot of issues to consider. But the good news is it's slow. When else have we had a problem that's not a matter of if it will happen, like if we'll get struck by a meteor or, or an asteroid, 
or if there'll be a nuclear explosion, or if we'll have a Category 7 hurricane, which has never happened. You know, what, all these what ifs, sea level has to rise. It's as simple as ice melts at 32 degrees, or zero for you scientists. Um, they tease me because I talked in inches today at lunch, and uh, I should have talked metric. So, um, whether you're in the metric system or the English system, it doesn't matter. The fact is that sea level is going to rise. It has to. It's ice melting, and it causes us to think different because it is slow, and we have an opportunity to plan differently. It's going to happen over decades. And therein lies an opportunity. When else have we had a problem that won't hit one place, like where will next Sandy hit, okay, and when, and how high? Sea level is just going to creep, keep creeping higher and higher. There is no alternative. And once you get that through our heads, we can start planning. We can start adapting. We can build higher. We'll come up with better engineering and architecture once we focus on the problem. Because the second way I look at it is not only is it slow, but the truth is, we're really creative when we focus on problems, whether it be putting a man on the moon or dealing with cancer or you know, all the other things we deal with. I mean, that's what we're great at. But we haven't even focused on this problem. We're still arguing whether it's real or not. And, and then the third takeaway I have, my glass half full, is that despite this being a really big challenge and a problem, and I wish it wasn't what it is, but maybe that message has a powerful psychological, metaphysical, spiritual, religious, whatever you want to think of it as, in terms of our relationship to the planet, that's really at a different level than what we used to think of as environmentalism. Because this ocean planet, 72% of the surface area, is saying something to us. We were stable, the shorelines were stable, except for the odd bit of erosion or occasional storm damage. But now the ocean's getting taller. Again, it was a natural phenomenon, but we've now put it into an artificial stage. We would be entering the stage of the cooling cycle. We'd, we'd entered the, the 80, we'd ended the 20,000 years of sea level rising by the natural cycle. The reason it looked like it was flat was we were at the turning point. We were gonna enter the 80,000 year phase toward the next ice age, or ice age maximum. But we've extended the warming phase. Carbon dioxide's higher, temperature's rising, sea level's rising. There's a lag time. We do not know and we will not know how bad it's going to get how soon. That's unfortunate. But that's just reality. There is no way to predict how Antarctica is going to collapse. We could get three feet of sea level rise this century, we can get 13 feet. We need to hope for the, we need to do three things. We need to hope for the best, that it's not 13 feet, that it's more like three. Begin planning for higher sea level as soon as possible, but not panic. And slow the warming through the greenhouse gas reductions, one means or another, so that we take our foot off the accelerator and decrease the speed of the warming. If we don't, if we don't reduce the rate of warming, the greenhouse gases, we're going to warm quicker, melt the ice quicker, and sea level rise quicker to the point of getting catastrophic. So it's a different paradigm how you look at things. And what's exciting about a liberal arts education and things like the Clark Forum here and Dickinson is that you do bring these things together. And Marcus and I were talking over lunch, and um, I thought I was a bad geology major because I didn't get into uh, petroleum or mineralogy or things like that. I never really pursued it. But obviously, there was part of this lesson about paleo or quaternary that that really took with me. And in fact, it became the way that I could explain this in a way that nobody else ever had. I could read the science well enough, and I, could, and I, I just wouldn't stop till I could answer every question. And I used peer-reviewed literature, so the scientists kind of liked the way I explained it, but I didn't talk like usual scientist pu publications. I tried to use metaphors that are easy to understand, which we don't usually see in scientific literature. My goal was to make sure that, just like I did tonight here, that people could understand it's the point where they didn't have to believe me, that just common sense and some basic facts were intuitive and irrefutable. And from that, they could act on their own. And you get that at places like this. And I didn't realize, I didn't quite appreciate that or what it meant to my studies and my work until I was in, I was in Greenland in 2007, as I described in the beginning of the preface, when this book 
came, came to me like an epiphany, as they say, and it really is true. In about three or four seconds or less than a minute, I had the idea for this book because I realized that in explaining climate change, I needed to make it real to people. And I needed a clear way to do that. And it suddenly hit me standing on the coast of Greenland, that sea level, which I knew about from paleogeology, and the glaciers, which were melting in Greenland, all that came together. And I thought I could tell a story that would bring in the science and put it into plain English, no jargon, that people could understand. And it's worked better than I would have imagined. So those of you who are students here, how many are students here in the room? No, most, okay. Um, you know what, I hope this both helps you understand something particularly, but also looks for opportunities for your interdisciplinary studies, for some ways that you can innovate. Because adapting to this problem is really a big deal. It's gonna take decades, um, no matter what we do. You know, just basic attitudes about, that, that are emotional things like civil rights or women's rights or gay rights and so on, which we, we think were big battles, and they were, and they were important. Those are just attitudes. Understanding, for the world to understand that the shoreline is no longer permanent is gonna be a much steeper learning curve than any of those other attitudes, because it means that for the first time in human civilization that the shoreline is no longer fixed. And people confuse it with erosion from storm waves, or they confuse it with the monthly high tide from uh, king tides, or they conf you know, confuse it with, uh, with other forms of flooding from rainfall. But sea level's different because it's essentially permanent. It's not the proper term. <laughs> But there's no model that shows us that sea level will go down for a thousand years. So for human purposes, let's just call it permanent. And that's different. Most people don't know that. And every one of you here tonight can help tell that story. And so besides the, uh, you know, there's a huge opportunity, I say, to adapt. There's as much opportunity as there is risk. Uh, to con I guess to recap, I don't like a lot of words and slides, but storms, tides, and sea level rise are not the same. Sea level rise is slow, but it's effectively permanent, quotes. Sea level rise has different effects in different places. You've got to look regionally, locally, geologically, uplift, subsidence, et cetera. And then do not confuse planning for sea level rise or adapting with the other good efforts to reduce greenhouse gases. I've seen groups really be concerned about both and then put all their efforts into greenhouse gas reduction. You need to do both. Sea level projections differ and they will change. They're probably gonna keep getting higher as the ice becomes less stable. And so people say, well, how high should we plan for? The simplest metric I can give people is plan for the first three feet of sea level rise as soon as possible. It doesn't get any more general than that. It's a meter if we're talking you know, in the metric system. But, and it's to say, don't try and fine tune this down to whether it's 15 inches or 16 inches. Don't worry because the ice is gonna keep melting and sea level will keep rising. If you build too high, the ocean will catch up to you at some point. This isn't a probability or possibility, this is a certainty. It is only a question of how soon. And that comes back to the greenhouse gas question. Lastly, I'll tell you, we're starting a new nonprofit. We've got our 501c3 status. It's the International Sea Level Institute. If you want to watch a little video about that, sealevelinstitute.org. Um, brand new, and it's going to be an interdisciplinary uh, effort that um, I will be the initial lead on. And uh, for those that want some of my slides, if you just send me an email, you can take out your phones now if you've got them out, but dickinson at johnenglander.net, not com, .net and you will get instructions on how to download a set of 12 slides for free. No ads, no, don't do anything with your emails. And um, those are my other information. So thank you very much. We're now gonna begin the question and answer session. Uh, this event is being recorded, so please raise your hand and wait for us to bring you a microphone. As our policy, we're gonna give students the chance to ask the first two questions. So we'll now take the first question. Um, hello. Um, I was just wondering if you knew any examples of how local communities or nations that are ch trying to having 
any adaptions to the rising sea levels? Sure. Um, in, in San Francisco Bay, there's a city called Foster City, which is just south of the airport. It was built on fill land. They built it two feet above sea level 50 years ago because that's all they thought that they needed to be concerned about. And uh, they're now increasing the height of the levees. Okay, so that's an example. Miami Beach is porous limestone. Seawalls won't work there because the water will just come up through the ground. But they're putting in pumps, $400 million worth of pumps, to keep salt water off the streets at peak high tide. Uh, Annapolis, Maryland, where I spoke a few weeks ago, and the U.S. Naval Academy have a, a slightly different problem. I mean, they're very low at the, at the low end of the peninsula there on the Chesapeake, and there's a funneling effect on the Chesapeake. Um, they're looking, they, they're a historic community, and they don't want to really change the historic character, the <laughs> authenticity, but they've now recognized that, and they do have some higher ground, that they're going to need to elevate some things. And so different places with different contours and different rock structure, different subsidence amounts need to take different solutions. And it depends then on what do you want to plan for. And it's, easy, it's easier to plan for six inches than it is for six feet, obviously. But what's interesting is if you plan for the bigger amount, so like say you can build a 10-story building one floor at a time if the foundation is right. Whereas you can put in a foundation for 10 stories and then build a floor as you need the office space, in effect, or a house, whatever. But if you build a one-story building, you can't keep adding floors onto it if the foundation was designed for a one-story building. So the point of that is, if we know that sea level is going to be 5 and 10 feet higher someday, rather than raising the roads a foot, let's take a little more time and design the master plan and get them up 3 feet. Or if we're building a bridge structure you know, let's design it so that knowing the boats have to get underneath and there's a clearance tolerance and the bridge is going to be there for 100 years, let's go 10 feet because it doesn't matter in the span of the bridge. We've got to think bigger. We've got to think farther. We tend to think like five years is a long time or 20 years is the life of a project. And we may amortize things over that. We may finance them over 30 years. But uh, we have all sorts of structures that have been around 100 years. We've really got to think different. So, yes. What effect do you expect sea level rise to have on the political and economic situations of South Asia, specifically Bangladesh, India, and Pakistan? If that isn't too big a question. No, it's fine. Certainly uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and Vietnam all are countries with vast, low marshlands, rice fields, whatever you, know, you want to think of them as. They're very low above sea level. They have tens of millions of population that are vulnerable, so they're huge issues. Sea level is one of these issues. It's a global problem. I mean, every coastal community in the world and on tidal rivers, you know, like Sacramento and London and Washington, D.C. So I think in terms of sheer number of people who are at a poverty level, those are great examples. Uh, as we look all around the world, we're going to see lots of, lots of examples. Jakarta is an example. You didn't name, just to give you one example. Jakarta, Indonesia is one of the world's most populous cities. It's sinking because it's at the confluence of, I think, about 15 rivers. And it's had the most sea level that I'm aware of in the last 30 years. It's had 13 feet of sea level rise in the last 30 years. Not because the sea level's gotten higher, but because the land has subsided there more. Okay? And they have some huge vulnerability. So the point is, no matter where you think of, okay, it's, it's you know, the foot or the tail of the elephant. You know, it's part of the... This is a global problem. You, can't, you really can't pick Miami or Manhattan you know, or Boston or, or Annapolis. I mean, this is a global problem that we need to think of locally. And there are some places we're not going to save. Because here's the simple reality. Think of this. Fast forward, whether it be 50 years or 250 years, sea level's 10 feet higher. Just astounding. We never would have thought of that 20 years ago. But it's going to happen. I mean, it's in the pipeline. Now, once you know that sea level is higher, whether it happens 80 years from now or 280 years from now, we will not have defended every bit of low-lying land, whether it be Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Miami, or the Florida Keys. It's not possible. And dense urban areas are different than rural areas. So we just got to open our minds a little bit. You know, we emotionally as humans, and this gets into the, uh, something that I skipped over, you know, the psychology, the politics, 
the um, national security, foreign relations, migration. You know, we think we got a problem now with a million people a year in migration. Wait till we have tens of millions in a decade, you know, that, more than that, in fact. So this is a mind-bending problem, something we've really never considered. Even those of, that were, were concerned thought that if we just did the other environmental things or reduce greenhouse gases, maybe this one would go away. There's no case for that when you look at it. So all I can invite you to is that, that every one of you as a student, professor, alumni, resident of the town, you know, this is new information. Share it, whether you take my stuff, whether you write your own book. Um, it, it doesn't, however you want to get this out there, but this is a different view of the world. And I know that I'm right because not only, I don't mean that egotistically, I didn't know that when I wrote my book. I, don't, I, I had it you know, vetted by a few people, but I have now taken this into the den of the lion. I mean, to every doubting, I've testified to Congress, I've taught it to national security interests in, in the military. Nobody's found a, a flaw in the logic or the fact. I know it's solid. And um, so that, I'm not, I didn't mean that if it sounds boastful, but the fact is this is a new reality. It's a revolutionary reality. And there's nothing as profound as the shoreline, you know, moving far inland. And not, I'm not smart enough to know all the implications of that. I'm really not. Every one of you, no matter what's your area of interest, your contacts, your influence points, you're going to have other ideas. So I don't know if that helps. But we tend to think about where. You know, when everybody names, well, what about this? You know, whether it be Pakistan, Bangladesh, Miami, Bahamas, et cetera, the Maldives. It's every coastal community in the world. So. I think the un uncertainties you provide when, with how much and when sea level is going to happen is pretty clear to me. It's pretty obvious. But I wonder what you think it's going to take for us to become more certain, more accurate, and precise on how much sea level is going to rise by when. And Maybe, maybe that's more research on things like pylon and glacier, which we talked about earlier today, or like what, what do we need to make that okay. error bars less? Sure. Great question. How do we reduce the error bars on the projections? And I can be pretty specific. For the next 20 years or so, the most sea level can rise is a few inches. Call it four to six inches. And that's the worst scenarios I've seen. Beyond 20, 30 years, when you get to mid-century, kind of all bets are off because we don't know how those glaciers are going to destabilize. And it's not just a matter of more measurements and more models and more study. It's two miles of ice, three miles of ice, and we're destabilizing. Some of you saw chasing ice when uh, James Bellog was here. And you saw what happened there. That wasn't, you know, digital animation. That was March or May 23rd, 2008, when in an hour and a quarter, an area of Greenland collapsed that nobody ever thought could collapse in an hour. It's not in a model. Now we know that can happen now, okay? Um, with time, we'll get better. But the truth is there's the possibility of that happening in Antarctica, which you saw happened in Greenland in that movie. And we, the good news is at the moment, we really think that we've got at least 20 years before something nasty can happen. But it's happening now. Miami's got streets flooding every 28 days. I mean, this isn't something we can put off. But that's why I say plan for the first three feet as soon as possible. When people say, what could happen this century? I say, well, first of all, the metric of the year 2100 is an artificial line. It's 84 years from now. What's so special about that? Because the next decade is going to be even worse. So we get fooled by our language, which gets into psychology and communications and English, frankly, OK? I mean, in 1988, when they started the IPCC, they looked at the year 2100. That was 112 years in the future. Now that same benchmark is 84 years in the future. Why did we shorten it by 25 or 30 years? Stupid. Doesn't mean it doesn't make any sense, OK? So if we want to think 100 years in the future, fine. But the truth is, the curves go up in such a way, exponential, that some pretty crazy stuff starts happening once about 60 or 80 years from now, or could, I should say. So I wouldn't get too hung up on that. I, when people say to me, OK, John, what should I plan for? I say, Build for the first three feet as soon as possible. If you've got the latitude, build for six feet. Um, if you really want to get bold, think five or 10 feet. You know, that, th those, are good, those are good big steps. Um, I don't think we can build for 10 feet in most places quickly. 
you can build for three feet in almost any place pretty quickly. We're going to have to get used to this idea that the sea is rising for a long time. And, you know, there'll be some silliness, people saying, well, I've got, I'm going to have oceanfront real estate in Kansas, you know, or Tennessee or something like that. And oh, that's, good. that's, you know, a little bit of gallows humor is, is good. It helps, to, it helps to break the tension on this. But the truth is, that's not real. Because as sea level keeps rising, the shoreline's going to keep moving inland. And it's not like you know where the new beach is going to be. And it's so slow that the truth is, I mean, you, you can't really buy the next generation of waterfront real estate. So, I mean, you can build up. You can build up 10 feet and know that the ocean will come to your seawall. So, yes, sir. What, question? No. Yes, can, can you summarize what's going on in Antarctica in terms of the changes of the ice mass on the land and in the sea and how that relates to uh, the sea level rise? Absolutely, good question. I think what you're probably referring to is some press which have indicated that what's happening in Antarctica is, counter, is contrary to sea level rise and, and global warming. There have been some stories about East Antarctica growing, and that's confusing, so it's worth answering that question. The oceans are warmer, therefore they evaporate more. We get more moisture in the air, it's gonna come down as heavy rain, heavier rain, or heavier snow, right? But that doesn't mean that we're not gonna have drought, like in California, up until the El Nino this year. East Antarctica, or Antarctica is such a big cold mass that when you put more moisture in the air, it's gonna come down as snow because of the prevailing wind currents on East Antarctica. So East Antarctica is getting thicker. And it also extends out, and if you look at it in terms of mass, the sea ice on East Antarctica is even extending further, so it looks like Antarctica is getting bigger. The problem in Antarctica is those, the six glaciers on West Antarctica, which are destabilizing. And when they want to slide into the ocean, as was predicted in a paper in 1978 by a guy named Dr. John Mercer from Ohio State, and they're well on target to do what he predicted 36 years ago, um, we're going to get 10 feet of sea level rise. We don't know whether that's going to happen this century or next century. That's a fair question. We won't know. We'll get better and better information as time goes on. But to answer your question, Antarctica is really an enigma because Greenland is Greenland. Antarctica is really West Antarctica and East Antarctica, and they're very different. East Antarctica is pretty much solid land. It is growing in thickness and tends to make us think that global warming is somehow having the opposite effect. But it's West Antarctica that's a lot of it goes underwater, and those glaciers are prone to destabilize or collapse. And it's those really advanced measurements that we get now from satellites and ground stuff and, and so on. And, cameras underneath the glaciers that tells us that the problem in, in West Antarctica is instability. And we, I mean, the, the Thwaites, the Haynes, the Smith glaciers, we know that six glaciers add up to 10 feet of sea level rise. Okay, so when you look at it overall, people say, and, the, and some of the doubters or skeptics say, ah, you know, Antarctica is getting bigger on these, uh, and they don't even know where, but we've got it covered. I mean, it, it really, it, the numbers add up. And it's the instability on these, the west side that's the problem. Yes, a couple more questions. We're, we're, it's only 12 after 8, so we're not too bad. Yes. Hi, I'm a senior international studies major, and um, one thing that you said that really resonated with me was that this is a global phenomenon that has local impacts. So given that, how can you foster global cooperation and create policies if it's going to impact each area differently? You, know, you probably are better equipped to know that than I am. Um, I don't, you know, I don't mean that flippantly. Um, there was a gentleman here introduced himself that had retired from, uh, you know, foreign service, you, you know. Um, most people in the world haven't thought, don't know what you now know. This is going to take decades or a generation to understand and, and adapt to. It's going to take dozens of different initiatives, if not hundreds. But changing our concept of things, you know, going back to Galileo, 400 years ago. This isn't a whole lot different than that. It's not different than the theory of relativity, which part just got proven last week, I guess. I mean, science keeps asking questions and trying to get better answers, but there's dispute within science, even, even in the hard sciences. We, the social side, the political side, the country side, the question you asked, um, I don't have the answer, 
All I know is that as it becomes clear that the ocean is rising and that the higher sea level will exacerbate storm surge and high tide, you know, people are waking up to this. I've seen a tremendous difference in the three and a half years I've been lecturing and consulting. And um, I'm in some ways encouraged, but it's going to take a while. It's, it's not going to happen in the next three years. This is a generational change. However, having said that, it's hard to ignore the water. And, you know, Miami didn't want to pay attention to it, but now they're putting in millions of dollars of pumps because there's salt water in the streets. It's rusting out the car, you know, the wheels on cars and stuff like that. It's spoiling their, you know, touristy, uh, you know, Mecca and real estate values, but they've got to deal with it, so they're putting in pumps. I mean, sea level rise is something you can't really turn your head to for very long. So whether it be Vietnam or Bangladesh or Pakistan or Miami Beach or Foster City or Annapolis or Boston, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna have to wake up to this. There really is no choice. This is about as basic as it gets. The, the coastline is moving. We just didn't know it. A Couple have, more questions and then we'll uh, break and I'll do the book signing and- We have time for one more. Okay. Um, so you've been talking a lot about the time frame being like three to five years where we have to start thinking about these things. I know for some of the students, we're still going to be on campus, and for others, we're going to be freshly graduated. What can we do to start moving into that direction that we start actually working on these issues, maybe outside of Dickinson? Like masters, like what kind of trajectory should we take as Dickinson students? Great question. So. First of all, you know, as you're finishing your studies, I would look for interdisciplinary uh, projects and studies. The, uh, the, the adaptations are gonna come from architecture, engineering, legal, finance, uh, governance. Uh, it really is a whole spectrum. I like to say that sea level rise isn't an environmental issue. What surprises people? Of course it is. But the truth, I gave a talk to a law firm recently and uh, they said, well, our, our environmental law section isn't too big. I said, sea level rise isn't an environmental law issue. It's a property issue. It's a finance issue. It's a contracts issue. It's a public disclosure for public corporations. You know, it, it, it's a tort. It, it, it's everything, okay? And so how we think of it. So the truth is, there are probably very few fields you could go into where you couldn't have some impact. Communication, media, journalism, psychology, um, you know, they're, they're tremendous. So you're at the right point to take this. This is a new reality. I hadn't quite figured this out till 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Um, so, anything else? Uh, don't forget to join us for the book sale and signing in the front of the room. Okay. And uh, please join me in thanking our guest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be with you. I really enjoyed coming back to the campus, so thank you very much.